with three all of which are malignant, all of which are different types of testicular cancer. We're thinking that this mass right here is the primary. It could be either of those three. So how do we tell the difference between the three? Well, we've got some other information we can use. We've got age. Some of these are related to age. We also have tumor markers. And if we know something about the age and the tumor markers of these different types of cancers develop, maybe we can make a good guess. So let's take a look. Very handy. Okay. So it says alpha fetal protein and uh, human chorionic gonadotropin is elevated. Okay. It's 30 years of age. So let's just take a look at this chart so you can get a quick guess. Okay. Just look at the age. What's within that age range? We got embryo cancer. And looks like we got corneal carcinoma. And we got mixed tumor. And teratoma, I suppose, is in there as well. Everything else seems to be a little out of range. It also makes alpha fetal protein and human chorionic gonadotropin. So let's see. This one, embryonal cancer, still could be a possibility. 90% HCG or alpha fetal protein. Let's see, choriocarcinoma, that only makes HCG. So choriocarcinoma wouldn't be a good choice. Looks like teratoma and mixed germ cell tumor can also be a possibility since. They both elaborate there. So, embryonal cancer's uh, still in. Embryonal cancer and teratoma. And mixed. Okay. Well, let's see what choices we're given. Here are the choices we're given. So, Narrow things down to these three. Oreo carcinoma, we definitely said was out. It can only be one of these three. And it looks like mixed germ cell tumor is the best option. We've got these three choices, all of which are malignant. Uh, seminoma, that's frankly not within that age range, usually. Older men develop it, age 40 to 50. Those are the typical ones. And honestly, the seminoma, pure seminoma, doesn't really elaborate any hormones. Okay, so this would not be a good option. Choriocarcinoma would be within the age range, but it doesn't elaborate alpha fetal protein. So those are four choices. Okay. All right. Let's take a look at number five. A 55 year old man has dysuria, increased frequency, and urgency the past six months. Okay. Dysuria, frequency, urgency. Each one of those might have a meaning. How would you interpret dysuria? Possible cause of dysuria, in with urination. That would be specifically caused by a urethritis. Urethritis and urethelium is probably irritated. That's one main cause of this area. Frequency and urgency. What is that usually caused by? You gotta, you gotta urinate frequently and you absolutely must urinate. Uh, they could be related to prostate, but specifically these symptoms would be associated with irritation of what tissue? It's a bladder, yeah, it's a cystitis. Typically 
say that's a cystitis, okay? Frequency and urgency. It could be caused by other things. If you, for example, you had a BPH, maybe you weren't using the full capacity of the bladder due to the enlarged prostate collapse and prostatic urethra, you'd have frequency. At least it would start off with frequency, nocturia. Uh, if the retained urine uh, due to the prostatic uh, BPH, you probably retain some urine. That urine can get contaminated, it could cause inflammation. Uh, once it gets contaminated with bacteria and gets infected, it can cause a cystitis that then would evolve into frequency and urgency. So it could be that those are related. Okay, so sometimes he experiences lower back pain. Physical examination, there's not no fever. There is no CV tenderness. No CV tenderness. That's an important negative. What does that rule out, basically? Thump on the costal vertebral angle. No pyelonephritis, so the kidney's not involved. So that rules out. Pyelonephritis, very unlikely. If this person had a pyelonephritis, he'd also have a fever or even have a fever. So it doesn't seem like the kidneys are involved. It just seems like it's a lower urinary tract thing. The prostate gland feels normal. No nodules are palpable. Laboratory studies show that there's prosthetic increases. Secretions contain 30 white blood cells per high power field. I'll tell you that is elevated. So there's more white blood cells than. There should be. What is the most likely diagnosis? This is a hard one. Let me ask you this. Does he have symptoms of a lower UTI? Yes, he does. He definitely has symptoms. Of a lower UTI. Does he have symptoms of an upper UTI? No. No kidney. No fever. If he had an upper UTI, he'd have CV tenderness, he'd have a fever. So, whatever's going on is associated with the lower urinary tract. <clears throat> so, he's got a lower urinary tract infection. Hmm? Well, if you had to choose from one of these, what would you rule out? He's got a UTI. What do we know about UTIs in men? Is that common? No. No. Not common at all. Can we rule anything out here? Rule out E. Rule out which one? E. E, metastatic prostate, prosthetic adenocarcinoma. Yeah, I don't think we really consider that. The prostate's not large, it's palpated, it feels normal. If this were prosthetic adenocarcinoma, we would usually feel something nodular, maybe hard. Something would be palpable, usually. I don't think that's the case. It would have to be something kind of unusual not to be able to feel some palpable change in the texture of the process if someone has that in first one. What else can we rule out? Which one? I, I would rule out B. B, acute bacterial prostatitis. I'd agree with that. If he had an acute bacterial prostatitis, he'd be very symptomatic. He would probably be in some pain. Uh, he might even have a fever and have a lot of pain. He might have a fever. Okay. Anything else? Can we rule out anything else? Syphilitic prostatitis. Yeah, that would kind of be unusual. Uh, syphilis doesn't usually infect the prostate. Syphilitic prostatitis. Okay. How about BPH? He 
TBH? No, no BTH. And usually, again, you feel something, you feel some large, large prostate nodules again. Well, that leaves us with chronic abacterial prostatitis. Does that make sense? Does it make sense? Yeah, it does. One of the most common causes of recurrent UTIs in men is actually chronic prostatitis. What does abacterial mean? Without that, so what's uh, what's causing the chronic prostatitis? Okay, so let, we're getting just a little ahead. What? Why? What's causing the prostate to become inflamed? I'm gonna go H. pylori. H. pylori. <laughs> say, it's the only one I know. It's the only one I know. If we had a gastritis, you'd be right. H. pylori. You wanna know what's in No, that's wrong. I wanna know why the prostate's inflamed. Oh, is it a no? Stress for being a fourth semester Cairo student. You got prostatitis? I have something going on. <laughs> All right, so chronic back, chronic a bacterial prostatitis. So you're a bitch. That's usually the organs. Chlamydia. Uh, Chlamydia. Chlamydia is an organism. It's actually a bacteria. So why do we call this a bacterial prostatitis? Because this organism is so small, if you look at a sample of uh, secretions or prostate, you're not going to see anything with light microscopy. This organism is generally too small to see with light microscopy. And so sometimes this is a condition is called aseptic prostatitis or a bacterial prostatitis. It's actually caused by chlamydia generally. Chlamydia will say the chronic inflammatory response. And these leukocytes are probably lymphocytes. And chronic prostatitis is a very common cause of UTIs. Yes. Yeah. It's a very common cause for recurrent UTIs in men. Uh, chlamydia is very difficult to treat. It gets into the prostate. Prostate is a sanctuary tissue. So even if you treat this with antibiotic, you will wipe out the urinary tract infection, but inside the prostate, the chlamydia will hide from the antibiotic, they'll proliferate, and they will receive the urinary tract. The man will develop a recurrent UTI. And so this type of infection of the prostate, chronic A bacterial prostatitis, is a very common cause for recurrent UTIs in men. So is there any other uh, bacteria that causes um, UTIs? Yes. But this is like the main one that we should be. Well, this is the main reason why men develop recurrent UTIs. Recurrent, okay. Recurrent UTIs. I mean, you can have E. coli, uh, Staphylococcus saprophyticus. Mm -hmm. That's another one. Yeah. <laughs> you, you just give a uh, uh, higher dose, longer duration. Oh, sure. That's all. Yeah, Doxycycline, doxyworks, azithromycin. I think we're still using azithromycin. We actually changed. We went from doxycycline to azithromycin back to doxycycline. That's, I think that's the latest now. Anything else? Okay, so the important take takeaway message here is this is the most common cause of recurrent UTIs in men, an infection of the prostate. And it's usually some organism like chlamydia that's hiding in the prostate. Typically what happens, a, a general practitioner might just give the antibiotic, clear up the UTI, the guy feels fine, and maybe a few days later, this organism's proliferating and it recedes the urinary tract and the man presents with urinary tract infection all over, wondering why. It's because we didn't treat it right the first time. And this organism is hiding in the prostate. 
Okay, so this was kind of a challenge. All right, anything on this one? Okay. 70-year-old man, previously healthy, comes to his physician for routine exams, feels fine. On palpation, his prostate is normal in size. Laboratory studies show a PSA level of 17 nanograms per ml. Okay. And that must be twice the value that he had one year ago. Yes, I guess it was, I guess one year ago, it was 8.5 nanograms per ml. One year later, it's 17. What do you think of that PSA level? It's very high. Do you think it's something benign? <clears throat> yeah. Uh, <clears throat> when you have a PSA level that high, that's probably cancer. The probability with which you will have cancer is a function of the PSA value. If you have a PSA value like five or something, that could be anything. It could be BPH, it could be trauma to the prostate, it could be cancer. But in fact, it, the, the matter, the fact of the matter is it could be anything. But when you have a PSA level that high, uh, that's that's really probable for cancer. Okay, so let's uh, read on. Which of the following histologic findings and subsequent biopsy specimen of the prostate most likely account for patients' current status? So the author of this question is assuming we're going to make the diagnosis, the diagnosis of prostate cancer. Going to work with that. Okay. So, which one would you choose? Adenocarcinoma. Adenocarcinoma, because that is the most common type of prostate cancer. That is prostate cancer. Okay. Acute prostatitis, how would he present? Possible fever, localized pain. Okay. It doesn't seem to have those symptoms. He comes in asymptomatic. This doesn't sound right. Chronic abacterial prostatitis, how would that present? Symptoms most likely consistent with a lower UTI. Chronic prostatitis is kind of indolent, doesn't really cause a lot of pain. The prostate is not that inflamed. It's inflamed with chronic inflammation, but not acute inflammation. So it's not going to generate a lot of local pain, but it will cause bacteria to seed the lower, uh, lower urinary tract. And so it's going to present probably with just a lower UTI. Okay, nodular hyperplasia, meaning benign prosthetic hyperplasia. That refers to BPH. And we, again, we should see an increase in size, maybe a little bit nodular, okay, prostate gland. According to this, the prostate gland is a normal size. BPH kind of enlarged. You might wonder, well, if this is prostate cancer, why aren't there any irregularities in the prostate? It could be developing in part of the prostate. It's not palpable. Somewhere in the periphery, but maybe not within finger's reach. Okay. We based our diagnosis on the basis of the PSA. The PSA is very high. It's just hyperplasia is not going to count. And what's this? Prosthetic intraepithelial inflation. PIN. This is just a dysplastic lesion. This is not cancer. This is the forerunner of prostate cancer. So you've got glands in the prostate. You've got an epithelium that make up the glands. Okay. Sometimes the cells become dysplastic. If it's dysplastic but it has not evolved into a cancer, we call that prosthetic intraepithelial neoplasia or PIN. 
This is the equivalent of CIN in the woman. Cervical intraepithelial neoplasia, that's the dysplastic cervix. Well, this is a dysplastic prostate, PI. Yeah. Same concept. What does the uh, abbreviation C slash W stand for? Uh, consistent with. Symptoms consistent with lower UTI. Okay. We got two uh, fairly challenging ones in a row. A 69 year old man presents with urinary frequency, nocturia, and dribbling, and difficulty in starting urination. Okay, so frequency, nocturia, is going, he's urinating at uh, night. He's probably having trouble starting urination. Okay. First question I would have for you is this consistent with a lower UTI? Frequency, nocturia, dribbling, difficulty starting urination. Is it consistent with a UTI? Yes. Some of the symptoms like frequency might be, but is it really, do you see any more symptoms consistent with a UTI? Is there are urgency, dysuria? Yes. Dysuria? Is he complaining of dysuria? No. Does he, does he have urgency? He does not have urgency. Okay. This is actually not consistent with a UTI. Because we have some things missing. If this guy has a UTI, there should be some discomfort when he urinates. That's called dysuria. If he has a lower UTI, then that bladder would probably be irritated and he'd have a cystitis. One of the main presenting features of a cystitis is urgency. You gotta go now, you can't defer. That's urgency. He does have frequency, so why does he have frequency? Yeah, I think I think it might be something where he's retaining a lot of urine. He's not using the full capacity of his bladder. Let's let's read on. Rectal examination remarkable for an enlarged hard prostate. Okay, that could collapse the prosthetic urethra. If he's got a collapsed prosthetic urethra, it's going to be hard for the bladder to completely void itself. Now imagine you have a bladder. A uh, with a capacity of, well, typically about 400 ms. 400 ms. You fill up the bladder, you completely empty it, you're going to displace 400 ml of fluid. But now you've got a prostate here that's squeezing the prosthetic urethra. It's difficult to get all those 400 ml out when you've got the prostate trying, constantly trying to collapse the urethra. So maybe. When you have that prostate, it's kind of collapsing the prosthetic urethra. You start off with 400 ml of urine. Maybe you'll empty about empty it down to about 200 ml, whereas normally you would be able to empty it down to about zero ml. Now you're only voiding half of your your, your bladder's capacity. So if you're only using half of your bladder's capacity, you should be ur urinating twice as much. You should be going to the bathroom twice as often. That's the frequency. Okay, that also explains the nocturia. People with BPH, they have to get up in the middle of the night. Perhaps a couple of times. Okay, also explains the dribbling. Difficulty starting urination. You go to the urinal, if this prostate squeezing the prosthetic urethra, it's going to take time for the bladder to contract down hard enough to overcome this closing pressure. And so when a man goes to the urinal, he stands there maybe for a few seconds before he can even start urine. Okay. Needle biopsy is remarkable for increased glandular elements. 
glands are found to uh, see glands are found to have a single layer of epithelial cells, and they're let's see, it looks like the glands are back to back. So here's the question: Is this prostate cancer or is it BPH? How do you know? Okay, so let's take a look. If this were BPH, <clears throat> what would the biopsy be remarkable for? What do we see histologically with BPH? Glands and what else? Glands and stroma. Glands and stroma. You would see glands and stroma. Increase in glands plus stroma. And if this were a cancer, what would we see? Just glands. The That's glands true. would be very crowded. Would there be a lot of stroma? No. No, there wouldn't be. Let's take a look. Remember we compared normal BPH and cancer? Here's BPH. Obviously you can see the glands here, there are lots of them. But you also see a lot of stroma. This is all stroma in here, right? Lots of glands, lots of stroma. Look at the cancer. Lots of glands, do you see a whole lot of stroma? So if you biopsy the prostate, Basically, you see all these glands back to back. Would you choose BPH as a diagnosis or cancer? Cancer. So, what's the most likely diagnosis? So you got glands back to back, meaning there's very little stroma in there. And <clears throat> if we have our answer, it's certainly not BPH. Prostate cancer is the best answer. Acute prostatitis, again, there would be some local pain. Probably would be some fever. Okay, and chronic bacterial prostatitis. Uh, again, there would be uh, on a biopsy. By the way, we'd also see on a biopsy, you would see increase in neutrophils because it's acute inflammation. Chronic pro bacterial prostatitis, we'd see probably mostly lymphocytes. Lymphocytes, obviously, neutrophils to lots of lymphocytes. That's chronic inflammation dominating over acute inflammation. Granulomatous prostatitis, we'd see presumably granulomatous inflammation. We'd see giant cells. Okay, epithelioid cells. You can see granulomatous inflammation. And all we see are glands back to back. That's the answer. Yes. So, If uh, so, if we have lymph nodes that are large and non-tender, that's yeah. a bad sign, right? Yeah. That would be consistent with some sort of metastatic cancer to the lymph uh, lymph nodes, making them hard. But since they're not reactive, they're not inflamed. They're not going to be tender. Same with prostate. Prostate. Uh, if you had if you had acute inflammation. It yeah. should be like the pain should be off the charts. If you touch the prostate, he's going to yell. Okay, chronic prostatitis, the symptoms might be, it might be a little tender, but probably not painful. Uh, with prostate cancer, 
Assuming the cancer isn't causing any secondary inflammation, it probably will not detect. Firm and large, not tender. Okay, so here's the key right here. You've got glands back to back, no stroma. I mean, that, that's telling you cancer. You don't even have to guess. Okay. So let's take a look at some female system questions. 36 year old woman has menorrhagia pelvic pain for several months. She has had normal, uncomplicated pregnancy 10 years ago. She has been sexually active with one partner. One partner is trying to tell you that this, whatever this is, probably not a sexually transmitted disease, but we know in reality that would be different. Okay, the past 20 years, no dyspareunia. What's dyspareunia? No pain with intercourse. No pain. No pain. No pain with intercourse. Okay. On physical exam, she has a febrile, no fever. A pelvic exam shows a symmetrically enlarged uterus. Symmetrically enlarged uterus. No nodularity and no palpable masses. A serum pregnancy test is negative, so she's not pregnant. That's an important negative. All right, so what's your diagnosis? It's symmetrically enlarged uterus, no nodularity. What can we rule out if you don't know the right answer? Which one can we rule out? You can rule out for... Lyomyoma, we could definitely rule that. This would be nodular. I believe so. Astute observation. When did you get so small? Yes. So she's got menorrhagia, pelvic pain, this part, no dyspareunia. So what else can we rule out, or which one we can rule in? What do you want? To do? I think a lot of things, but I think we can rule out. So rule out. I'm gonna say the one that's the answer. So <laughs> yeah. Endometriosis. Want to eliminate that one? Yeah. 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 Final answer. Get rid of it. Okay. You're right because that would not present with any enlargement. No increase in size. Okay. That would cause that would cause a lot of premenstrual pain. It would necessarily cause menorrhagia either. Right. Endometriosis. Remember is a the presence of ectopic endometrial tissue in the pelvis doesn't necessarily have any effect on the uterus. But it's growth on the outside of the uterus. Growth outside of the uterus. So nodules on the, in the outside. Pelvis. Or is it? It's 
functional endometrial tissue in the pelvis. Oh. And the uterus could be perfectly fine. And it's just functional endometrial tissue elsewhere. Next problem, not chronic endometritis. Not chronic endometritis. I agree. Would that cause enlargement? No, it would cause chronic inflammation of the endometrium. You'd say the endometrium. would have on the chronic would have plasma cells a lot of chronic inflammation of course through the plasma cells but there would be no enlargement Choose. Yeah, choose. Doesn't have the I don't know what adenomyosis is, but I'm going to go with C. You're going to go with adenomyosis. Sure. That's gonna, Luke's answer. I'm going to go with the opposite. Write it down. Put my name next to it. And that's right. Oh, Damn. Right. Adenomyosis. What is adenomyosis? <laughs> what is adenomyosis? It's called marriage. It's called marriage. You can take a guess. No one's saying anything. <laughs> Sharing is caring. It's yeah. Characterized by the ingrowth of non functional endometrium into the myometrium of the uterus. And what happens is the myometrium reacts, and the smooth muscle gets big, and it becomes hyperplastic and hypertrophic, and it symmetrically enlarges, diffusely and symmetrically enlarges the uterus. And it can cause lots of pain and menorrhagia. Endometrial hyperplasia, how would that present? Well, it certainly can present with menorrhagia. Not necessarily any pain. And it's caused by an increase in estrogen. But here's an important one. No increase in uterus size. The endometrium is just the mucosa, it's the inside of the uterus, the layer of tissue that lines the endometrial cavity. Okay? So the endometrium becomes hyperplastic. It doesn't cause the whole uterus to enlarge. It'll cause a bleeding, <coughs> bleeding. It's caused by an imbalance of estrogen and progesterone. Okay. What keyword would you write next to adenomyosis if you were asked to? If I were asked to, I would say symmetrically large. I would say menorrhagia. 16 year old. I'd say dysmenorrhea. Whoever made this question. Dysmenorrhea. Okay. So let's get realistic. Let's say you have someone, you got a 55 year man presents to you, okay, with some prostatism. He's got a little discomfort, kind of perianal discomfort. PSA is 15 nanograms per ml. You perform a biopsy and you see glands with no stroma. What's your diagnosis? Prostate cancer. Prostate cancer. All day. All day. No stroma. What if you had a man presenting with frequency, no urgency, nocturia, his PSA level is about six. And so you do uh, Prostate exam, prostate's enlarged, take a prostate biopsy, you see 
Lots of glands, lots of stroma or sphagnum. EPH. EPH. Can you do that on the exam? What? Yeah. As you long can. as you do it just like, like that. Just, just like that. Just write those four. Yeah, Don't same question. question. <laughs> <laughs> so what's bold the points would be great. Yeah, you, you can bold those. Like words. fever, A pain. clinical question, just consists of bullet points. Yeah, but it's yeah. like mixed in a no, paragraph. It's all, you know. Uh, yeah. So you, gotta, you gotta read. Yeah. You gotta I don't know how to read. read. Yeah. Okay. Well, what, well, what's a normal PSA? Normal PSA. According to the labs, it's less than four, but not really anything over two. Questionable. Yeah. That's, that's not. Okay. okay. Uh, Colleen, I could not use that link you sent me, so I put everything on a USB drive. I have them already up to the drive. Okay, great. Look at that. Yeah, efficiency. That's, that's for no. That's that's perfect for you. Is that a real baby? <laughs> no, they brought the baby. We're doing that program. That's a seat. That's for CPR. Like, yeah. 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 <laughs> they brought in the CPR dummy. It's a really expensive one. It's fucking so real. Yes. Yeah. That was a real baby. Not a nice guy, though. Last try. Oh, yeah, that's a story. You have it? Yes. You have it? Yes. 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 But uh, are you going to forget that? Uh, I think it was like four pants. No, no, no. Six, seven. Six, six, seven. 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 I also don't think what increases, oh, increases in what increases in it should be like what increases B1 carbs, alcohol. Yeah, so what I'm saying is what decreases B12? Carbs, alcohol, and eggs. You just, you just worded it really weird. Yeah, that's why it's questions are so weird. 